Hey, everybody. Uh, it's nice to be here. I've got to tell you, I, I flew in very late last night to Helsinki, and I'm two hours behind everybody. So <laughs> right now, this is the first time I've ever spoken to a crowd at 7 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Um, apologies to Patrick. I, I slightly changed the subject today um, because I was thinking that hopefully this is more useful to you, and I, and I, and I hope it is. Um, uh, this is also my first health tech conference, so I hope what I say today is actually useful to you folks and not super obvious. I don't know. Um, I'm going to start, though, with a provocation. Can you see what this man is using to steer? I'm going to pronounce the Finnish word now. I'm probably going to get it wrong. Berasin. Yes? Okay. Why did they choose that for steering in the Victorian era? They were thinking about boats, right. So they carried the analogy of small vehicles that was incorrect into a new piece of technology. And steering wheels already existed on boats, but they chose the wrong one. Now, this pattern of taking your analogies of existing technologies and moving them into new technologies is very common. In fact, it took the film industry 20 years to figure out what a close-up should look like. Because if you think about it, early film was always filmed as though you were looking at a stage. Why? Because what they were thinking about was theater. So my challenge to you today is which analogies and concepts are we taking from traditional healthcare into the digital world? Because what I've noticed is that there are a lot of them. Anyway, on with the show. Uh, some of you may have heard of Babylon, I don't know. I will do a very quick intro and I will try not to go on too much, but just so you have some context to what I'm talking about. Oh shit, I nearly spilled all the water. Anyway, um, so our mission is to create an accessible and affordable healthcare service and put it into the hands of everybody in the world. Very serious about this mission. Um, at the moment, what our services look like are some AI-based uh, healthcare services, so we do uh, symptom checking. And we also do uh, long-term health risk assessments with a product called Health Check. Um, what we became known for and what we started with in, in London uh, was virtual care, which is still very strong and growing in the UK. And we're augmenting that with actual physical clinics where we know that somebody needs um, an examination in person. There's lots more that we're working on. Um, but I'm not going to talk much about um, all of that stuff today. Um, yeah, so there's, there's a suite of products here. And what we're, what we're really targeting at is quite a lot, really. I mean, we're, we're talking at targeting the sick care cycle, but also when you are well. So we have products like Monitor uh, and Digital Twin for when you are just in your daily life. Um, um, we have a pretty large global footprint. Um, we serve, for example, uh, two million people in Rwanda with the phone service. So we're, we're actually doing um, a lot in um, underserved uh, communities. Uh, you can see some of the countries we're operating in just starting to enter the US, uh, quite strong in Canada already, um, and Asia. So there's a lot going on. We're, we're, trying to, we're trying to really figure out how we can make this very broad and accessible for everyone. We're very serious about that accessible part. Um, OK. So this is really just kind of a set of lessons for you today. Uh, they're not like super well joined together, but I, I do hope they're interesting for you. Now, the first thing I want to talk about is taking healthcare beyond health needs. Um, you know, great product teams tend to revolve their thinking around good user needs. And it's very easy to think that you understand what they are, you know, when you start building a technology. But um, my, my point is, history tells us that a deeper understanding of what those needs are often yields great benefits. I tend to find the user research will uncover different things. So just to take a very well-known example, um, 
It may seem obvious what needs Uber was meeting when they started, but actually they were not obvious at the time. The service itself was no different from a regular taxi company, if you think about it. Just A to B in a car. You don't, Uber wasn't taking you there faster, um, and it originally wasn't really priced any differently. Um, so on the face of it, not very different. But when you start to look at the user needs, so zero interaction payment, it was very easy to specify where you were and where you were going. You didn't even need to talk to anybody. Um, and you were constantly aware of your pickup time. They managed to reduce everybody's anxiety around, oh, is it coming, or am I going to get there on time? So you don't have to look very far to realize that the needs that you might address um, with your service can look deeper than the obvious ones. And in the UK, the National Health Service talks uh, have developed a framework for needs that we use at Babylon, which I think is very, very useful to think about. So NHS Digital came up with this, that there are three types of need in healthcare, clinical, emotional, and practical. So let's break these down a little bit. I mean, they're mostly obvious, but OK, so I have tonsillitis. Um, how do I treat it? Eh, fairly self-explanatory. This is the one that the systems today serve best. So let's talk about emotional. We see a lot of this, for example, in our symptom checker. Lots of people not actually particularly ill, but have anxiety, the worried well, as we call them, right? Is this serious? Um, you know, for example, um, research in the UK has shown that lots of uh, older folks are actually visiting their doctors just for human contact um, because they don't see people very often. I once worked with a clinician who said, um, I give emotional support first and clinical support second. I thought it was kind of an interesting way of thinking about it. Um, and then finally, practical. And this is where I think a lot of systems are really failing. Um, where do I go now? You know, I, I liken healthcare systems to like an RPG. Think, think Zelda, right? Go here, do this, take this object to that person, then do this, right? You're, you're, you're on this kind of mission all the time, right? To, to do something and then collect something and da 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 and each step is new and new people. And, and, and unfortunately, the systems that we have in place today are often designed not with the user in mind, um, but with the professionals. Uh, you've probably all seen this. I know you're all working to make this better. I know you are. Um, but you know, I, I've only worked in healthcare for roughly a year. And I actually didn't know what oncology meant. I kind of knew it was serious, but I didn't know it was cancer. So if I didn't know that, the general population is not likely to be able to use a piece of navigation like this particularly easily. Um, so at Babylon, one of the things we care about most is making sure that these basics are covered. You know, where is my prescription? When is my appointment? Taking the basics, uh, uh, providing the basics is, is really important to, um, to make sure that our service is considerate and trusted. So another thing that I've come to learn just over the past year, really, is that each condition, again, maybe you've worked in healthcare a long time. Um, this, this stuff certainly wasn't obvious to me at first, was that each condition is a universe of user needs. So think about the, um, the example I showed earlier. Are we like, blindly replicating existing health services when actually there are more subtleties to each condition? You know, we talk about healthcare as though it's a discrete market, like fashion or e-commerce. I would argue it's not. It's a different order of complexity. It's actually not the same size or complexity of market. It's actually there's something else going on, and each condition is effectively a market of its own. So health systems today, for example, have one entry point. You know, if you have the flu or back pain, often you're undertaking the same journey as a user. You're going through what is the primary care system. And, but you end up with you know, solution X or solution Y. Um, only at the end do you get something actually different. But I think the future, and there are products that do this, actually needs to consider those conditions as very discreet. Right? If we think about flu versus back pain, the needs in that moment when you have those problems are very, very different. One group may need to stay in bed, but the other actually might benefit from moving around. I'm no expert on back pain, but you see my point, right? Actually, like a, a virtual, virtual health system may better serve one more than the other, um, or at least direct it more appropriately. 
So why do we force people to visit a doctor in every situation? And we're actually not treating those needs as discrete. So again, back to that example, uh, uh, Parasin, right? So how do we make sure that we're not using the technology in exactly the same way based on our old analogies? So I want you to imagine you redesigned healthcare from the ground up. Many of you may be working on this. Um, but if you put the patient experience first, and then you would look to great customer experiences elsewhere. And one of the main things that's considerate in a service that works well for people is simply knowing you well. Um, and that's a big part of what we're working towards because we're one of the only companies in the world that is trying to combine traditional health records and traditional primary care and secondary care um, with uh, digital health. Um, so as I mentioned, healthcare often feels like this confusing adventure game. Well, you know, think about services where you feel warm and welcome and considered. Well, they often just, you know, it's like the doorman who knows your name. Um, I believe there's a restaurant in Helsinki where they know your name in advance when you show up at the door. I don't know the name of the restaurant, but I've heard about it. Um, and how special does that feel? And I think that my observation is healthcare systems often feel like they have amnesia. You're just again, going on this adventure from person to person. Who knows you? Do you really feel welcome? You're just one of many to them, just shoving people through the door with efficiency as your primary metric. So I want to just give you an example from outside of healthcare, which has made me more loyal to a company than anything else I've ever seen, um, just as a kind of provocation, really. So I use a mobile network in the UK called GIFGAF. And it's not one of the big networks. There's four big networks. And they send me a single text message once a month. And it has made me more loyal to them than any other customer experience I've ever had. So every month, they send me a text message telling me whether my tariff is too high or too low. And then they say, you can change it. You can switch it up or down. Now, how many of these cell phone companies today are actually trying to lock customers into expensive tariffs. All of them, basically, right? So this one company, by actually treating me like an individual and respecting my needs, has won my loyalty for life. They're optimizing for lifetime value, not short-term profit. This is the kind of thing that we need to be doing to actually revolutionize industries. So my question to you is, you know, what could you do? What could you do that would make somebody that loyal? So the way we're working on it, um, you know, we're, we're trying to combine lots of different data sources. You, you all know how difficult this problem is if you've worked in healthcare. Um, but imagine you know, you're using our symptom checker, and actually we know all of this background information about you. Um, we're just starting to really kind of glue all this stuff together and then make much better predictions about your healthcare outcomes. I'm sure you've all seen this example. We know now that the Apple Watch, the newer versions of the Apple Watch, are actually saving lives because they can detect um, irregular heart activity. So again, if we often traditionally we've optimized for efficiency or short-term gain, my question to you is, what could you do that would win you a customer for life? Imagine if you'd been warned about a heart problem with this product. You are never going to leave Apple ever again, right? So, co-creation of your health future. You know, traditionally, when, we, when we've interacted with doctors, we've, we've assigned this huge amount of authority and, and trust in them. And that's right, right? You know, it's very difficult to become a doctor, and we defer to these wonderful experts in our most vulnerable moments. But now, you know, we've got access to this huge variety of tools and content. People are feeling much more empowered, like they know stuff. You know, we're in the self-serve age. So I want to show you two phrases that I, I think capture the tension that's emerging here. Uh, has anybody seen this before? <laughs> so I, 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 think, I believe some doctors have this on their mugs now, you know, <laughs> so that the patient sees it when they're coming in, <laughs> you know. And again, back to, back to the analogy, right? So it'd be very easy to replicate health systems that actually make this mistake um, of treating you know, what is effectively um, a patriarchal system right, as the default. 
But there's a flip side to this. Don't confuse the one hour lecture you had on my condition with my 20 years of living with it. A much retweeted counter example. So we must find a way in healthcare to resolve this tension. What's going on between these two things? And I want to show you how we actually kind of made a, a little bit of a mistake in this, in this realm. So when we were building our symptom checker, we, you know, we started with some key assumptions. And one of the assumptions was, actually, you, you're here, you're using a symptom checker. Oh, I don't know why it's not going forward, but you're using a symptom checker because you, you don't know what's wrong. Actually, it turned out only 10% of the people, when we did um, our, our ongoing user research, had no idea what was wrong. What's actually happening is, when people use symptom checkers, and it's not just us, is that they triangulate. They don't yet trust them very much. So they're actually trying to find three or four data sources that confirm the same thing. But we started with the assumption that, hey, we know best. You don't know anything yet. Again, these things that we take from the existing healthcare system into our future work by accident. So this story alone proves why it's so important to do user research and get your UX right. And we must respect you know, how much time people are taking to try to manage their own health, regardless of whether their beliefs are you know, uh, in, in agreement with doctors. Uh, I, I'm sure many of you have seen this quote, the digitization of humans will make a parody out of Doctor Knows Best. I don't think of it in exactly these terms. For me, it's about what is that marriage? What does that marriage look like between the expertise and the self-empowerment? OK. So who, who, hands up who's dealt with this problem moving into digital health? Just one? OK. <laughs> Maybe you're all geniuses of eliminating jargon. I don't know. So any industry with a sufficient enough history will inevitably carry some jargon with it, right? That's natural, because we need shortcuts to describe complex concepts as we move uh, it, you know, to act efficiently. But over time, you know, traditional industries become a little bit insular, and they carry words into the public sphere that actually people don't fully understand. I mentioned oncology, oncology earlier. So as we move into this self-care, uh, self-empowered time, how do we communicate clearly and describing things in ways that people understand? So first couple of months at Babylon, I ended up learning a lot of concepts like these. Um, and I was pretty confused, pretty confused by what people were talking about. But now I, I've kind of got the clinical lingo. Right? I work with them often enough to know what they're talking about. But I have to remind them, because the problem we face is that this stuff creeps into our products. It's very subtle. We try not to do it. We have UX people testing things. We have content writers who are not doctors. But still, this stuff kind of just creeps in there. And you have to kind of figure out how you're going to eliminate it. Um, so just an example of something we took out recently. Uh, are you having any problems passing urine? I've had doctors ask me this. But if you're on your own and you're not there to actually clarify what the doctor means, this is not a very good English phrase. It's certainly not very common. So a simple change we've made. Now, I want to give you kind of a guideline for, for potentially trying to fix this problem. So I, uh, I, I'm actually um, a UX designer who specializes in voice by trade. I've, I've trained lots of people in voice design all over the world um, for O'Reilly. Uh, I've trained people at NASA, <laughs> which I think I can die happy now, now that I've trained people uh, in, in, at NASA in technology. But one of the things I learned in voice is that you have to get people to read their content out loud. Because it turns out that when you write, you're a mu you, you write in a very unnatural way. Something happens in our brains. I don't know what the psychological effect is, but when you ask people to write, they actually just become a little bit longer, long-winded, bureaucratic in their writing. So what we started to do with our doctors and our content writers is actually have them write at home so they don't feel embarrassed to read their stuff out loud. And when they do read it out loud, it turns out that they actually find out it's not very natural and it's not very jargon-free. So this is a really good design tip. Get your teams to start reading the content out loud. And of course, this isn't purely um, 
you know, a design exercise, it's our goal to make the users understand this stuff because it is a safety issue. UX is a safety issue. It's not just the interface. The common misconception about UX is that it's just what you're looking at. It's not. It's how people behave, how people understand things. All right. So bringing the humans and the machines into harmony. You know, this is something that we're still in the early days of figuring out how these two things operate together. And I think, you know, there's a lot of talk about AI taking over. Um, personally, I'm on the fence about how much it takes over. I don't feel like I particularly know. Um, and, you know, future predictions are often foolhardy. But what I do know is that there are always going to be moments when humans are needed, always. Um, so let's look at some of those. You know, is it serious? Well, you need emotional reassurance. There are products that do emotional reassurance exceptionally well and have been clinically validated. So I don't know if anybody's used Wobot, W-O-E bot. It's extraordinarily good counseling, uh, mental health counseling product. Um, but coming back to my point, um, we will always need humans at certain points. Our product must be considerate, as I mentioned, and sensitive to needs. When is a human more appropriate? Because we don't want to end up doing this. We need to have good uh, bedside manner. Um, and when we think about user research, you know, we think about how people react to things, and we're watching their faces, looking at the expression, not just what they say. And in this one particular case, we needed to give people a warning about something potentially serious. If, for example, our symptom checker suggests something might be more serious than the user realizes. It turns out that people don't generally use symptom checkers if they think it's serious. They will always go to a doctor in that situation. But occasionally, obviously, the symptom checker might find something that is potentially serious. So what we found was quite counterintuitive. We changed, we took out the word cancer, and we changed it to signs of something serious. Because in that moment, when people Google, and, they, and they've done so much Googling, Google's always saying cancer. So it becomes a, a boy cried wolf situation, right? If digital products are always telling you something serious, then you start not to take it very seriously. But the problem we have is we actually want you to take it seriously, and we want you to go and see a human in this situation. And this tested very well. What we've been finding is that signs of something serious as a term, as a phrase, actually makes people more likely to go see a human in that situation than the word cancer. So by making serious content less alarming, we can add credibility, even though it may be less specific. People will seek human help in that moment. Um, here's an example of um, something we haven't launched yet, but um, in the, our, our customer service agent, it's a bot. What we've determined here is that actually when somebody is annoyed about a customer service scenario, we should automatically send them to a human. So here you can see in the example, the uh, machine learning detects that somebody is annoyed and then pushes them to a human agent. We don't want the bot to deal with a situation like this. Even if it was smart enough to do that, it's better that they, get, they feel like they're getting human service. So two questions, really. Um, when is a human touch point needed? And how do you make successful handovers work? How do you persuade somebody, hey, digital is OK, or hey, human is where you should go? OK. Um, next one. Designing before regulation. Do we have any regulators in the room who are going to give me stick after the fact? <laughs> um, so this is, I guess, one of the interesting factors of being in a healthcare startup um, today. You know, we're heavily regulated, uh, rightly so. And I'm sure many of you have had to deal with healthcare regulation that applies to your product that maybe constrains you in some way. And obviously, regulation is a net good. Um, but what, as I'm sure you've all found, is that it struggles to keep up at, uh, at times. Um, you know, for example, you know, the, the ISO regulations that we conform to in our products, they use the word device. But we're not providing anything physical 
device-wise to a human. So the language embedded in those regulations cannot keep up with modern software practice. I think we, you know, the technology is changing faster than the regulation can. And I think you know, regulation is designed to keep us slow, safe, and auditable. Um, but in opposition, you know, the modern software context wants us to test fast. You know, so we want to find emergent. So emergent, fast, iterative. And I don't think either is good or bad. It's about how they fit together, how these two cultures come together and work together. But what I have come to believe is that it's very easy to design for regulation only which limits your ability to think about the best way to provide your product. So for example, um, our symptom checker has to display multiple diseases. It cannot, it cannot say to a user, you know, this is the definitive answer. And that's fine. I don't disagree with that at all. But we started designing this way. Um, and, and it's a problem here, because sometimes the top result is the highest probability result. We, d we actually don't want the user to see anything else because they're extraordinarily low probability. So the problem comes when you start designing for regulation from the start. If you think, hey, we must show a list, then you've already potentially compromised the experience. There may be a way to meet the regulation and not show it in the way that, the, 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 that you think at first. So my idea here really is that you should design for ideals first and regulation later. I want to be really emphatic about this. I am not saying, no, don't uh, launch things that are launch, launching things that are not compliant. I am not saying that. What I'm saying is you need to establish your ideals first. Why? Because it is much easier to make an ideal experience compliant with regulation than it is to make a compliant experience ideal. If you start with something that's designed by regulation, it may not be very good. So bring these two together, but design your ideals first. Again, just to reemphasize for anybody in the room who hasn't heard this clearly, I am not suggesting, no, do not comply. I am saying design your ideals first. OK. Related to that real world testing. I've I've often thought that digital products, or indeed websites, or anything like that, they're, li they're, like, they're like a wall between you and your users. I mean, if you think about, um, think about physical context like a shop, or indeed a hospital, you literally cannot avoid the feedback. You know, they will always come up to you in a shop and say, hey, where's the organic couscous? You know? But in a digital context, you're often missing something. We're not in their homes. We're not with them on the train. We're not with them at work. So there's a kind of gap here. And we do get some feedback, but it tends to be a little bit low resolution. You know, Think about Google Analytics. Your plat your, what's your analytics platform telling you about the human experience? Not a lot. So it turns out you know, this is why we do usability testing. We want to know what that experience is like. And we do an awful lot to gather that feedback. But it turns out that the traditional ways of doing this are probably not enough. Um, just an example, we were testing an Alexa-based product not too long ago. And it was for people when they were unwell. And this guy came in. And two weeks before that, he'd had a sunstroke. You know, he had a, a fever and all the associated symptoms. And he used the product, and he really liked it. He, he rated it like five out of five. He thought, this is awesome. I've never seen anything that does this in voice before. But then, at the end, he said, I would never have been able to use this at the time, because I could barely talk to anybody. So when we're designing for healthcare, it's actually really important to know that when somebody is struggling, that might change their not only their attitude to the product, but even their ability to use it. So traditional usability testing has some work to do. So what we care about um, with our remote testing at Babylon is getting people who are actually sick in the moment and testing while they are struggling or, even, or very close to it. So they can be more honest with us, tell us about what they feel about the product in that context. Um, I like this quote by Emmanuel Fonbu. Real healthcare occurs outside of the doctor's office and hospitals. So 
a couple of challenges for you. Like, are you testing your product regularly? And do you know what users think? Are the test conditions a true representation of people, you know, of how they will use it? And if not, how can you recreate those conditions? Um, it's actually really, really difficult to do this. It took us a long time to set up our testing so that we could get people in the moment when they are unwell. It's really, really difficult, especially when you're starting out and you don't have an audience. Luckily, we had lots of people using our service. All right. So I'll just come back to the, to the topic of my thought, uh, the topic of my talk. Um, why this title? Accessible, affordable, we know those things, but considerate. That is the main thing that we need to consider, <laughs> being considerate about consideration. Um, it's got to go so much more beyond what we think is important. It, for example, going beyond clinical needs. And I hope today I've covered some of the things that are useful to you about what it takes to go beyond that. And I, and I just want to show you an example, a, a recent customer review we had. Here's a review on Google that we had recently. It took doctors almost 15 years to diagnose my endometriosis. And it took this app about three minutes to figure it out based on my symptoms. That is a life-changing piece of technology right there. That is one of the things that makes me most proud about doing what I do. But look at the rest of it. Only improvement, I think, would be when hitting the back button on my phone, it immediately erases all progress in the questionnaires. That's a bug, by the way. Rather than going back to the previous question like I intended. Maybe a warning. You can see what, what she's talking about here, right? Is that we've given her a life-changing technology, but we need, she needs the back button to work correctly. That's what she cares about in this moment. And I hope that gives you a sense of all those little details that you need to consider and get right. Thanks for listening.